All right. Welcome everyone to the first Science Cafe of the Atlanta Botanical Gardens Conservation and Research Department of 2021. Um, we are really excited today to have Phil Seen with us. And before we get started, I just wanted to remind everybody to keep yourselves muted, please, during the presentation, and that um, everybody's videos will be turned off um, automatically. And the another thing is we would like, if you would like to ask any questions, please use the question and answer button that you should find at the bottom of your screen. It's sort of in the bottom on the left-hand side. So if you can just please ask any questions um, that you have for Phil tonight um, through that um, little box, we'll be able to answer them when Phil has been done at the end of his presentation. And with that, um, and this presentation is also being recorded. So anyone who would like to be able to watch it again, um, we will have that up on our Science Cafe website at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. And I will put that um, link in the chat for everybody to be able to see. And we'll also have that again at the end of the presentation. So with that, it is a great pleasure um, of mine to be able to introduce Phil Seaton. He is a biology lecturer by profession and an amateur orchid grower. Um, he has taken his retirement time to be a full-time orchid conservationist. And in 2017, or in 2007, um, he became the project manager of ASU, which is the Orchid Seed Storage and Sustainable Use Group. Um, I'm like, it's a good long acronym. Uh, and he has been able to, with that um, ASU, it is the aim is trying to establish a global network um, of orchid seed banks. Uh, Phil also has written many popular orchid journals and books, um, ranging from subjects um, to how to grow orchids to really exciting projects that are happening globally. And so we're absolutely thrilled to have Phil here joining us in his middle of the night because he is in uh, central England in Kilimanjaro, uh, and we are really grateful to have him up um, so late um, being able to give us a presentation tonight. So Phil, I'll let you have the floor. That's lovely. Okay. Right. Good evening, everybody. It's, <laughs> it's it's always one of these strange things to to uh, to be talking to a to a screen. It's uh, what time is it? Well, it's five past eleven at night here. It's not uh, it's not too late. Uh, not too late at all. OK, well, I'd like to talk to you about orchid conservation and it's uh, yeah, it's really actually it's really nice to have the opportunity to talk to a to a to a different group of group of people. So. Oh, let's just let's get started. Right. Well, look, just uh, just to just to sort of get my my stuff started, just to to, to get ourselves uh, into the into the mood and to and to get some sort of background. The, the the thing that sort of fascinates me at the at the moment is is as I'm getting older, I I have to say is that I I I, I suddenly realise that the uh, the past has a has a sort of a habit of, of becoming closer, really, rather than rather than far away. And uh, what you can see in, in front of you here is uh, the two, two photographs that, are, that are, I'm very, very fond of. On the, uh, on the left hand side here, you can, you can see my, my granddad Seaton and my, my, my grandma Seaton. And that cute little boy there is, uh, of course, is me at the age of about four years old. And then on the on the on the right hand side, I've got my lefts and my rights mixed up already. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see my uh, my great granddad there, and of course that cute little boy is still there uh, on the <laughs> on the left, and my, and my cousin John there is is sat on the uh, on that that piece of wood there. And the thing that really sort of uh, struck me not not so long ago anyway, it was that the, the realization, of course, was that. Uh, my 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 granddad uh, was born um, in 1876. Well, my great granddad was born in in 1865. It would appear on my on my mum's side. And you know, you start to think to yourself, well, what was the world like uh, when they were when they were when they were youngsters? And the population of the world 
1876 was about one and a half billion. And the CO2 level was about 290 uh, parts, parts per million. If we were to go ahead another 72 years uh, to 1948, uh, then you would find actually that 1948 is the is the year that uh, that I was that I was born, and I and I just love this photograph because because it is a photograph taken in in Medellin in in 1948, um, and in Colombia, and the 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 firemen there that you can see in the photograph are planting orchids in the trees. You know, I like to think they were doing it to celebrate my birth, but probably not. But the thing is that in 1948, the world's population was about 2.5 billion and the CO2 level was about 310 parts per million. So not too different to what it was in, in 1876. Well, if we take ourselves another 72 years forward, as it turns out, um, we find ourselves in 2020. Now, of course, there you go. I'm now 72. Um, and last year, well, I'm 73, actually, because of my birthday a few weeks ago. But, but, but anyway, in 2020, I was, I was 72. And 70, this happens to be the year that this little boy here was born. This little boy is called Finch. He is my grandson in Australia. And he is being held, obviously, by his dad, who is my uh, who is my uh, my eldest son. And you think to yourself, well, you know, what's the world population today? Well, it's about 7.9 billion. So the world's population during my lifetime has actually tripled. Since my granddad was born, it's increased by five times. And the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is around about 410 parts per million. We're putting tremendous pressure on the on the natural world. This is this is the issue, really. This is the point I want to make: is is how much things have changed. You know, from one and a half billion up to seven and a half billion uh, people, all wanting the same standard of living. I might add, as as you and I have as well. Uh, this is this is not really um, sustainable. I'm I'm afraid. And, and the question is going to become, of course. Well, what are we going to do about it? Because, you know, this little boy here is when he's 72, you wonder what the world is going to be like. And there's one thing about it, it's going to be very different to the world we have today. And what I would like to think anyway, is that this little boy is going to be able to enjoy the same uh, natural world uh, that you and I are able to, to enjoy. And specifically, you know, tonight I'll talk about orchids. I hope that little lad is going to uh, be able to enjoy the the orchids that we that we know and and love. So the question for all of us, I suppose, really for for a lot of these things is, is it really going to be, or are we at the stage where it's the last chance to uh, to see some of these see some of these plants? Um, the photograph here was was taken in in Madagascar a few a few years ago. Uh, this is my friend Dave uh, Dave Roberts on the left there. Uh, he is monitoring a population of Angraecum longicalca. And at the time, I have to say uh, that uh, we we thought that those were the only plants uh, that remained in the wild, and there are about uh, twenty five of them as far as we could see, um, because they were big clumps, you know, uh, then, then, you know, we, we took samples to take back to, uh, to Kew Gardens uh, for an analysis to see uh, just exactly how many, many clones there, there were remaining uh, in, the, in the wild. You see, you know, because I've got a, a, an American audience, I, I just thought, well, you know, we might sort of just think about wh where it is where where we're going with uh, with some of these uh, some of these species. Um, obviously, you know, down in the bottom left hand corner there, you've got the uh, the dodo from from Mauritius, which you know went extinct 
in the, somewhere in the, the late 17th uh, century, uh, you've got you've got the 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 passenger pigeon, uh, which famously was uh, was you know present in the in the zillions uh, at one time, and the last one it appears died uh, in uh, in Cincinnati Zoo, and I think it was 1914, and her name was Martha. I think that's um, that's really quite uh, quite sad. But all we have left now, look, are these are these stuffed. Uh, these stuffed specimens and really because I can't resist it um, I have to say uh, the, 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 the scruffy little specimen uh, up on the right hand side there is the, uh, is the Stevens Island um, wren uh, which, um, which was confined to one small island uh, off, the, off the coast of New Zealand until they decided to, to build a lighthouse there and, and we're not really sure if this is, this is true, but, but legend has it that the lighthouse keeper's cat, uh, called Tibbles, um, was, the, uh, was, uh, was the, the, the person who uh, caught, I don't think ate, but anyway, caught and killed uh, the last uh, Stevens Island um, wren. And then, of course, you know, the other photograph, of course, is the on the top left, there is the ivory billed woodpecker. And there's an interesting one um, because, you know, you know, there's still some sort of uh, argument or discussion about whether it still it, it still exists or not. Um, Richard, who you just saw a few moments ago, my, my oldest lad is a is an ornithologist and he said, no, dad, it's um, it, it, it's gone. Um, but you know, some of these orchids actually have got a funny habit of, uh, of of reappearing. It's it's very difficult to know when something really has uh, gone extinct, but it probably it probably has. What certainly has gone extinct is the uh, you know is the is the thylacine here uh, from from Australia, the Tasmanian wolf, uh, a marsupial uh, wolf, as it's uh, as it's been described. And and the reason I show you this this one is that that it, it, it you know the last one uh, died in Hobart Zoo in uh, in 1936 and I think actually there must be still people around who saw that uh, that uh, that that animal there. His name was Benjamin, uh, but Benjamin was uh, was left out one night in the cold by mistake and. Uh, and died, but uh, you, you can actually find little clips on the uh, on the internet of, of of him walking around in his in his cage. And you know, we don't really want these to be the fate of our our beloved orchids, do we? Well, just two more birds before we we we, we start looking at some some orchids. Otherwise, you're going to wonder what it is that you've you've uh, you've signed up for. But they they are that they're, they're really quite quite interesting uh, in in the story they have to tell. And I think the story that you might be sort of thinking about when it comes to to orchids. Um, what you've got, of course, on the on on the top left hand uh, corner there, is uh, Spix's macaw. And Spix's macaw uh, went down in Brazil, in its native Brazil, uh, to one remaining male uh, in the wild. Uh, they did try to introduce a female um, to, um, you know, to get the population going again, but, but this, this individual uh, disappeared. And it only remains now in, in captivity. There is a, a captive breeding population and the and the idea obviously is, is at some stage, if you can restore the habitat, and that's obviously key um, to, uh, you, you know, the, the aim is to, is to re restore this bird back to its, its natural environment. And again, you know, let's, let's just put a, an orchid sort of uh, spin on, on this. You know, this is, this is, this is the thing with, with orchids. We have orchids now, which probably only exists uh, in in cultivation, and in fact, um, it has been said that you know an orchid is no longer safe uh, unless it uh, it exists in in cultivation. The other one, the other one, the other bird 
you'll probably recognize is, is the kakapo, uh, which is a, a giant ground living parrot, um, again from New Zealand. Uh, and it's confined now uh, to, uh, to, to an island off the, off the coast of, of southern uh, uh, New Zealand. And the point really that, 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 that I'd like to make really with a, the with a kakapo is that it, it, it sort of illustrates the fact that, that what remains in the world now is under our stewardship. Yeah. If you were to, if, if mankind was to disappear from, from New Zealand tomorrow, then a lot of the birds would very promptly disappear as well. Uh, because they would be eaten by the cats and the other introduced uh, predators that you have there. So a lot of the world's uh, wildlife, in fact, you could argue all of the world's wildlife, really depends upon us. And, you know, we are responsible for managing it. And if I may say so, again, you know, responsible for managing it. So that cute little boy that you, that you saw a few minutes ago is going to be able to enjoy it in the same way as you and me. Okay. So look, what has happened with the, with the orchids? Well, in the past, of course, in the 19th century, orchids were collected from the, from the wild by their, well, not their thousands or their tens of thousands or their, their hundreds of thousands, uh, by, but by their millions. And, and this is just a really quite a rare photograph taken in the in, in the late 19th century by it would seem by well certainly by this this fellow on the right here albert millican and it was it's been taken in 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 colombia and these people are what they're doing of course is they are they're collecting the orchids from the wild so these are campesinos the the native uh, population uh, the native villagers who who Millikan has hired to go out there. And if you look closely, you can see the axes. And so these, these, these fellows here are chopping, uh, chopping down the trees uh, to, to obtain, the, obtain the orchids. And so, you know, a massive amount of, of, of orchids were, were, um, were imported, in, particularly into, into Europe and, 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 and particularly into, into England in the, in the 19th century. And, you know, these large populations are, are very, very rare in, indeed now. And, and I have to say that, you know, you might be surprised, or I was surprised anyway, to find that, that actually illegal collection of orchids um, still continues uh, today. Uh, what we have on the, in the little black and white photograph there is, uh, is, a, is a photograph taken again in the 1940s, it, it would appear, of, uh, of, 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 of a gentleman there who's been collecting the orchid that you can see, see in the colour photograph uh, there, which is Lelia speciosa to, to sell uh, in, in May, actually, it's uh, the Flor de Mayo in, uh, in Mexico. But even today, um, these, these orchids are collected by their thousand, uh, so I'm told, uh, in uh, in Mexico, the photograph, the colour photograph, is a is a very rare photograph. Uh, by the way, I was uh, I was in Mexico around the right time of year a few years ago, and and asked if I could be taken to the market to see this happening, and I was told, well, you perhaps, but you know, you can't take your camera, well, unless you want to lose your camera. Um, so you know, this is you know, this is this is still still happening, uh, which, is, which is very disturbing. So what are we going to do? Well, as you can imagine, uh, there have been a number of, uh, of international and international agreements uh, to try to, to protect the, uh, the biodiversity. Perhaps the, the best known is the, is the Convention on, on Biodiversity. And that was part of the Rio summit in, in 1992. Uh, where politicians from around the world got together to come up with a plan. Um, hopefully it's going to happen again this year, uh, later, later on, once, uh, once COVID is, uh, has been defeated, if that's the right word. And as you can see anyway, 
Uh, the idea of the Convention on Biological Diversity is to conserve ecosystems, species and, and genes. And just to sort of make a point, um, you know, the UK government's response to that was a, was a Darwin initiative. And I'll talk about the Darwin initiative in a, in a moment or two. But the Darwin initiative uh, was a project whereby we teamed up institutes in the, in the UK with institutes and in, 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 in other countries where there was lots of biodiversity, uh, but actually uh, they, were, they hadn't got the financial resources. So, you know, the UK is, as, you know, as, as, as economies go, a rich economy, uh, but, uh, you know, somewhere like, uh, what shall we say, Costa Rica or, or Colombia or Ecuador is not as, uh, is not as fortunate. So that was the, that was the aim of this, uh, of this project. And you've also got a, you know, you've got a, a global strategy uh, for, for plant conservation, uh, which really is, is, is setting uh, similar targets. The only problem really uh, that, I'm, that I'm having, I have to say with targets, is that at the moment we're not really hitting them. Uh, we're not even close uh, to hitting them. So we're hoping that the, uh, that the, less, that the next um, conference they have uh, might actually come up with some uh, realistic and, and obtainable targets uh, and um, you know we can you know we, we can then get our act together in terms of, of, uh, of orchid conservation. Okay so look what are we doing we're conserving we're conserving habitats and so I thought we might not like to have a uh, 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 one or two habitats to uh, to just to illustrate the point. Uh, you know, you are very lucky uh, living in a, in a in a country with such enormous uh, diversity of habitats. So you you know you have the the uh, the Florida ghost orchid there, Dendrophylax uh, lindenii, uh, which I was uh, fortunate to, to be taken. Uh, to uh, well to see the habitat I didn't see the ghost orchid uh, by uh, by my friend uh, uh, Chuck McCartney who's recently passed away I'm very sorry to say uh, but that's uh, you know that's an example of what we're trying to do is to is to conserve a, a unique uh, a unique habitat we're also you know interested in in conserving species and you know we we know the orchid family has something like well. 30,000 species we don't really know because we're still discovering new ones every every year uh, but it is arguably the largest plant family uh, other people would say no it's the daisies fell but you know it doesn't matter does it really it's you know there's an awful lot of diversity within the uh, within the, the orchid family and you know, we're also interested in preserving uh, genetic diversity as uh, as well. And uh, well, I'm very fond of this slide for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, these so this is this is a, a collection of of, uh, of uh, plants of Lelia of Lelia anseps uh, that I grow in my in my greenhouse uh, just up the uh, up, up at the end of my garden. Uh, and at the moment, they're in flower, so it's very very nice at this time of year. But what it does is it, it sort of demonstrates to you uh, the diversity that we want to, to conserve within, within species. I'm, I'm really trying to persuade um, botanical gardens that rather than having one plant of this and one plant of that and one plant of the other, they should at least um, have populations of, of, of one or two uh, target species to to show the, gene the genetic diversity within, within that, uh, that species. And, you know, and I, and I have this suspicion, actually, a lot of these, these plants are still um, alive and, and well in, in, uh, that were collected all these years ago in, in collections somewhere in Britain. Lelia anseps for us is, is fairly easy to grow, but, you know, you get little surprises because the one on the top right-hand corner uh, was given to me um, a few months ago, and it's flowered to me for the first for the first time, and um, and it's very different to to any Lelia anseps uh, that I was that I've ever seen before. Uh, I was given it as Guerrero, which is the 
the one on the left, it's not Guerrero, is it? Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but I need to talk to my friends in Mexico and see what it is. And then, and of course, these taxonomists have got this, this habit of splitting their species up. And what I find is that the, the Lelia anseps had a, a variety called Lelia anseps dorsonii, uh, which now they've decided actually is a real species, Lelia uh, dorsonii. But, you know, it's, you know, where is it? It, again, it was imported into large numbers in this country, and I'm at the moment trying to find plants of it. The only one that I've discovered is the one on the, the uh, bottom right-hand corner there. It might not be the most, um, what can I say, it's not the flattest flower for, for those who want to have flat flowers, but I found this one at, um, uh, the, uh, in the University of Botanical Gardens, the University of Bangor. In, in Wales. So there are some of these things out in collections uh, which we really ought to be finding and, uh, and propagating. And, uh, you know, I like to think that perhaps, uh, perhaps Emily, you might, be, uh, you might be out there seeing if you can find some of these things to, uh, to propagate before they, they disappear. Okay, well, look, yeah. One of the issues I, I find anyway with, with orchid conservation is, uh, you know, Lelia anseps, uh, let, let's be honest about it, Lelia anseps is, is always going to be, be, be there because it's, it's going to be remaining cultivation, isn't it? The, you know, the Mexicans love their, love their Lelia anseps. So it's, you know, it's not likely to go extinct, although it could go extinct in the wild, I suppose. But it's you know it's not likely to go extinct. But if you're if you you know if you're an orchid that, that looks like this this one on the on the right, um, then then your chances of of um, what can I say of attracting uh, funding uh, for, for your your conservation are, are a little uh, a little little reduced. I would I would suggest to you. Uh, this is uh, this is an orchid called our our heart wegii. Um, and it was, um, and it, and it, 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 it isn't dead. <laughs> it is actually, you know, it, it, it's, it's alive and well. And it's grown at 4,100 meters in, in Ecuador. And, uh, you know, I haven't got a super duper camera. So I, 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 I took the photograph of, uh, of my friend here, uh, Francisco Tobar, taking a photograph of, the, of this, this little, uh, this little stick-like orchid, but perhaps it, you know, it, you know, it emphasises the the value of preserving the habitat, because of course by preserving the habitat, then you're going to preserve the the things that are are within the within the habitat. Now, of course, you know, a lot of these things coming back to to what I was saying about the the kakapo. A lot of these things will only survive if we, if we, uh, if we manage them, uh, or manage the environment correctly. So, you know, I live in Worcestershire, you know, in the in the, the in the middle of England, and and Worcestershire is actually uh, well known for have, having some of the best remaining orchid meadows in the country. In fact, some of the best remaining meadows in Europe. And I'm very fortunate. I live about ooh, half an hour drive. Uh, from from this place here, uh, which is uh, which is a place called Eads Meadow, which has ooh, hundreds of thousands of green winged orchids in flower uh, at the end of May, um, and similar amounts of, of common spotted orchids, and then it has a few it has a few uh, fragrant orchids, bee orchids, uh, common sway blades. It really is an orchid rich habitat, but it does need to be managed. It would not be there if it wasn't managed. And it's probably never been fertilized, it would seem, for, well, as far as we know, ever. Um, you know, when it was turned into, the forest was cleared and it was turned into a meadow, it's remained as a meadow ever since. But 90, 97% of our flower rich meadows in the UK have disappeared since the Second World War. So these habitats are really very, uh, very precious. And, and I keep saying that the heroes of conservation, I think in the, in the United Kingdom anyway, are the wildlife trusts. So the Worcestershire Wildlife Trust manages this, uh, this meadow. There are populations of, of other orchids out there, big populations. Uh, this is uh, the Paphiopedalum hirsutissimum, 
um, which uh, I saw a very large population of this in China. I was really quite, uh, quite surprised uh, to see again thousands of this uh, of this plant in in, in flower. Um, what is more typical, it has to be said for, for slipper orchids, for almost all slipper orchids, is that there are only a few remaining populations out there. Uh, and, a, and a good example of that is the, is the wonderful uh, Papiopedalum ferianum, uh, which, which uh, my understanding anyway, is, is now two small populations, one in Bhutan uh, and one in, uh, one in India. Uh, but of course, you know, we can raise these things from seed. Uh, I do have one in my greenhouse at the moment in flower. Not the easiest thing in the world to grow, I have to say, but we're managing so far. And of course, my aim is to, is to succeed, isn't it? As I would. So look, although I'm going to talk a lot about ex situ conservation, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I need to make it clear that, that obviously uh, the preservation of, of habitat uh, probably is the is 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 the best, or well, certainly is the is the best thing to uh, to do. And so what you've got here is a photograph of of, uh, of a reserve um, in, in Colombia, just outside Medellin. If you get the, the chance to go to to Medellin, then you sh then you should take the uh, the teleferico, the the cable car, up to Parque RV. And so I was taken up by to Park ERV. The, the, the lady in the middle of the, the photograph is the is Anna Maria Benavides. She is the uh, head of science at the botanical gardens in, in, Medi, in Medellin. A lovely girl. We helped fund her PhD. And here we are. Uh, this is uh, you know this is just a little walk through uh, the forest that they are the secondary forest which they are busy. Uh, restoring at the moment and they are doing well something that's being done at Atlanta Botanical Gardens as well. They are planting orchids in the in the trees as you can see and you know just to oh I've, I don't know why I pressed that sorry about that. Let's just there you go. Yep and there you go uh, that just gives you an idea of the sort of uh, things that you find in the uh, in, in, in the environment in Parquet RV. Uh, it's the tinies, it's the tinies really. They, you know, most of the orchids are, are tiny things. They're not the big showy orchids that, that you tend to, 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 to focus on. It shows most of your, your orchids are, are, are smaller things. And just another example, just, you know, just to make my point, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a, a reserve set up by the, uh, the Colombian Orchid Society uh, near a place called uh, Jardim uh, that I was taken to. You can see me in the middle there somewhere, my smiling face. Phil, come for your photo. Um, that's <laughs> they, they really were shouting at me, come for your photo. I was trying to get my wife on the on the phone. Um, yeah, and this is this is a reserve that they that they have per, you know they have purchased the land. Um, to, uh, to to set up a, an orchid an orchid reserve that we were we were taken to see, and you know restoration of the of the forest is is obviously key. It's you know a really interesting place I have to say because uh, you know it contains such lovely things as this uh, Miltoniopsis vexillaria. The the one on the the photograph on the right uh, was taken by me at a show in Medellin. Uh, but I was very kindly sent the photograph on the left there with the, with the same orchid, uh, but growing in the wild in the, the reserve that you've just uh, that you've just seen. And so this is this is, you know, people say, what can I do to help? Well, actually, well, I'm afraid donating your money is a, is a thing that you can that you can do to uh, to help to, uh, you know, so my Worcestershire Wildlife Trust can buy more reserves and you know they can do the same in in Colombia. It's an interesting one um, because uh, I, I was sent uh, this this little ticket here, uh, which is uh, which was made out to Albert Millican, who was the fellow in the black and white photograph that you saw you saw earlier, 
um, and it's a, it's a, a customs uh, receipt because he's sent, if you notice, 125,000 plants of Josephinas. Josephinas are Miltoniopsis vexillary, and he was sending them uh, to uh, to a Mr. Broom and White of uh, of Chelsea. He was sending them to to England. So again, that makes the point, uh, you know, about how many orchids were being collected. That's just you know, one collector, one small consignment, I might say, to, uh, to, uh, to England. So, okay. So as Emily said at the, uh, at the beginning, I've, I spent most of my life actually uh, teaching, uh, teaching uh, biology in a, in, a, in, a, in, a local, in a local college. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm a biologist by, uh, by, my profession, but but with a special interest in orchids, and and I took early retirement. Oh, I don't know what sixteen years ago or something, something like that. And uh, my friend Hugh Pritchard, who I'd been working with, and sort of you know on a sort of casual basis for for many years, um, is um, is is head of uh, research at Kew's uh, Millennium Seed Bank, and he said, "Phil, he says, can we, um, you know, do you think we can get a grant?" Uh, to set up a global network of orchid seed banks. So, of course, I said, well, yeah, we'll give it a go, Hugh. And, of course, what we applied for was money from the UK's Darwin Initiative uh, to set up a global network of orchid seed banks with the <laughs> with, with a name that doesn't really trip off the tongue, does it? Orchid Seed Stores for Sustainable Use, but also for short. Um, and we, we, we had funding uh, to, uh, to run a number of workshops and this photograph was, was taken at our last workshop back in now in 2010. I can't believe it's more than 10 years ago, but anyway, there I am smiling amongst people from, well, uh, without sort of going through in detail, we've got people from, from Thailand, Singapore, Estonia, the Philippines, Costa Rica, Brazil, Bolivia, Ecuador, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Chile, uh, Panama, Indonesia, Colombia, the USA. He's the person who took the photograph. Uh, Vietnam. Yeah, you're getting the idea. Guatemala. Yep. So you know, we would we we ended up at one stage with 27 uh, 27 partners, and the idea really was to was to encourage people to uh, to store uh, to store orchid seed in seed banks. And our partners were, were really a sort of a, a range of different uh, institutes. And in the end, they included and include uh, Atlanta uh, Botanical, Botanical Gardens. And this is a photograph of, of Birmingham Botanical Gardens, you can see uh, on the right. Um, but the, you know, the, the herbarium specimen there on the on the left also illustrates the point that what we wanted to do, of course, was to be sure that the plants that we we'd got were accurately identified. Um, it wasn't just botanical gardens. I have to say, uh, universities have turned out to be a very good source of uh, of long term uh, commitment, if you if you like. And we also uh, included, you know, organisations uh, such as the. Uh, the Orchid Association in uh, in, uh, in in Cali, associated with the uh, the botanical gardens in Cali. So we, you know, we the idea really is to involve everybody, uh, and I think you know also I have to say, uh, commercial uh, commercial institutions. But but as I say, you know, identification was 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 a key thing and remains a a, a key thing. Um, I just sort of give you an example here uh, with what you've got in front of you there are photographs of, of an orchid which at one time was, 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 this was one species but now has been divided into, into two. So you've got on the right hand side there the very purple job. This, is, this really is Encyclia phoenicia uh, but it grows in a very different uh, locality. Uh, to uh, another orchid, which was also called Encyclia phoenicia, but now is uh, they've decided it's Encyclia brevifolia. And really, just I wanted to, you to notice is the difference in habitat, because oh, because uh, 
Brevifolia um, grows in a very sandy, dry environment, and specifically on these, uh, these palm trees here in the axles of the leaves, whereas uh, the Phoenicia uh, grows in Sienetica sapata, uh, which is a very uh, moist environment, a very swampy sort of environment. And so it becomes important to know where your, your plants were collected from is really the point I want to, I want to make, to have as much information about them as you, as you possibly as you possibly can. So, you know, good identification is, is really uh, a key part of the, the project. And, you know, you may, just to, just to make the point again, you know, we have this, this young lady, Melania, at, um, at the Botanical Gardens, Lancaster Gardens in Costa Rica. She is doing the classical il drawing illustration on a, a drawing point, so to get a good, a good record. And the young man on the on the right hand side, the Puyom, he was working at, uh, at Kew for a project again in Costa Rica. And of course, he's looking at DNA barcoding. And again, this is something which is being done at Atlanta Botanical Gardens, isn't it? The DNA barcoding as a way of identifying species is becoming increasingly uh, easy to do uh, and increasingly important. Right, okay, so once you've got your orchids, what we want to do, of course, is to, to pollinate them. And so the young lady there on the, on the left-hand side, Paula, uh, she, is, she is pollinating an orchid. And the point I want to make here again is that actually I spend a lot of time um, showing people how to pollinate orchids. It's, um, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Big showy flowers like Lelia Ansepts, they're a piece of cake. But some of these tiny things uh, need a little, a little more uh, patience. And, and of course, in the end, what you're hoping to get is, uh, is, a, is a seed capsule, you know, on the, the seed capsule on the right hand side is, is not immediately occurred. It's a different plant um, to, uh, to the one that you can see Paolo, Paolo doing. So as uh, so you've got, uh, you've got this, uh, this, this, this seed capsule. And then of course, and then of course, you know, you want to, you know, you want, you want to, to encourage people really to, to, to pollinate their, their rarer, their rarer plants. The photograph we got here is a young man by the name of Mariano, and he is working at the Eric Young Orchid Foundation in the, uh, the Channel Islands. And they are, I don't know, certainly one of uh, the world's best collections of uh, of orchid hybrids but of course to make their hybrids they they also have have species and when i was visiting uh, suddenly I, I i saw that they'd got this very lovely plant of odontoglossum crispum and so i said to mariano i said you ought to pollinate that didn't you and mariano said okay and so look here's a here's a seed capsule and of course bless his heart he's sent me uh, seeds. So I'm now re uh, raising lots of plants of, of Odontoglossum crispum and Sidim Alexandra, is it? I mean, I should call it now. Um, uh, but something you should be growing at Atlanta Botanical Gardens, I believe. Okay, so here you are, look, we have students. These, these students are in a, in a lab, uh, which is uh, in, in a local school. Uh, the local school has um, has given me space to to teach youngsters how to how to grow to grow orchids from seed. So I'm a very lucky man, uh, and uh, you know they give me the lab, and in return, I teach students. I mean, when I started teaching, I used to think, do they really pay me for this? It's such fun. Well, now they don't pay me, and it's still fun. It's great. So I'm uh, yeah, I'm teaching youngsters how to how to grow to grow orchids from seed. And in some cases, uh, you know, we do actually grow them using the symbiotic fungus as well. Uh, this, is, um, <laughs> this, this, is, this is a friend in, in, uh, in, in Jordan uh, who, is, uh, who, who is isolating uh, fungi. Um, uh, but, um, but I also do the, uh, uh, do the same, but I thought, well, 
come on, you don't want to see me, see somebody, somebody else. This is, you know, this is happening around the world, especially when you sort of think to yourself, well, I wouldn't have thought there are orchids in Jordan. Yes, there are, there are mountains and, you know, and yes. So there he is, um, he is, he is uh, isolating fungi. Of course, what we want to do then is to count the percentage germination. Orchid seed storage is not just a matter of, you know, pollinating, collecting the seeds and stick it in a seed bank. You want to know if it's alive or not. You want to know what sort of percentage germination you're going to get. You want to monitor the percentage germination over time to see if it's declining. If it's declining, then you want to know why. If it's declining, then you might want to get another collection. Uh, you may want to grow some more plants from seed to 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 enhance your collection. So it's an ongoing thing. It's not a sort of a, a store and, and forget. The whole point of having the seeds is obviously that they are that they have some purpose in life. Uh, they are going to be uh, you know a var valuable resource for reintroductions, for enhancing living collections, for education, uh, for all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. The problem, of course, with with you know the conventional uh, germination testing is that it is uh, you know very time consuming and so for many orchids not all by any means but for many orchids you can actually stain them uh, with uh, with uh, tetrazolium and what you can see here is a wonderful photo actually taken by my friend John Kendon at Kew showing you the results of staining uh, staining orchid seeds and the ones with the nice bright red embryos are alive and that empty, well, that one with a white embryo is dead. So it's quite an easy, it doesn't always turn out as clearly as that, let's get this straight, but it is actually a very quick technique. You can do it in two days, whereas germination testing can take weeks or even months sometimes because some of these things can be very, very slow to, to germinate. So it's a very, very useful uh, technique and, and actually, um, I, I had a, a young lady come across from um, well, called Jenny, uh, who came across from a school in um, in in Illinois uh, to um, to learn how to do this, and then to go back to her school and to uh, to teach her friends how to do this as part of a, a project uh, that they were setting up uh, with the uh, the local wildlife reserve. So here you are. You know, it's, as you can imagine, you know, what we want, of course, is more young people to be, to be involved. So what you have is these smiling students. This case, they're in Brazil. It's the Unoeste in Presidente Prudente in, in, in Brazil. And what's on you, the person at the top left-hand corner is my friend Nelson Neto there. And he is, he is teaching his students again about orchid seed storage. And what he's demonstrating, what they're demonstrating with a desiccator that you can see in the front of, is that the key, the key to storing orchid seed in the long term actually is to dry it uh, to begin with to, to, um, to its optimum percentage moisture content is, uh, is what, our, what our aim in life is, uh, is to do. So the seed must must be dried. Not everybody has wonderful laboratory facilities. And so really, you know, the, the thing that I've, uh, that I've been doing is persuading, particularly amateur growers, is that they can dry their seed uh, using dried rice. And as it turns out, actually, uh, dried rice, because that's another seed, uh, if you dry it to the right moisture content, will actually uh, give you a similar sort of seed moisture content uh, to some of the more uh, sophisticated um, saturated solutions of chemicals that you uh, that you would use in that desiccator that you you've seen seen there before. And so what you've got, in fact, what you can see in the the picture here by the seed in, in a cupcake case um, is a little sachet of, of silica orange, um, and the colour of that actually uh, is a, is a good indicator. Of what the relative humidity is within the within that uh, within that jar, and so if it starts to turn green, then you know uh, that the 
uh, that, that, you know, you need to renew your, renew your rice. Okay, and then of course we're talking about sticking it in a freezer, aren't we? Or a fridge. Um, and this is, you know, I, I show this photograph because, you know, you, uh, you, you would like to see a photograph, wouldn't you, of the of Q's Millennium Seed Bank, this, this enormous concrete bunker, you know, the largest collection of uh, non-crop seeds uh, in the world, um, a big, big concrete bunker. It's, you know, nuclear bomb proof, uh, you know, below, below ground. And this is my friend Tim here uh, showing you some uh, some tubes of, of orchid of orchid seed. But the point I'd like to make really is that you can do exactly the same in a domestic freezer at minus 20 or in a fridge at five degrees. Uh, I store all my seed at, at five degrees and I have seed which has been, well, the cyclic finisher, funny enough, uh, which I've now been storing for 15 years and it is still showing good uh, levels of, uh, of germination. Um, so uh, it's uh, you know it works it works you can store seed successfully for 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 long periods um, in a fridge or a or a freezer. So look you know here I am again you know it's me in the middle but really making the point that that, that for me anyway um, education is 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 really a key point of 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 what I you know I personally am, am trying to. To achieve this is this is a workshop I gave a couple of years at the botanical gardens in uh, in Bogota and you know again it's people of all ages let's get this right it's but you know I'm always happy to see you know youngsters uh, involved in in uh, in orchid conservation work uh, there seem to be an increasing number of young people getting involved which really really makes me makes me very very happy. And then, of course, part of the part of the thing is to is to um, is to produce books to teach people how to do this. And and you know, my if you like, so, somebody asked me not so long ago what was I most proud of, and actually I said, well, actually it's the little book in the middle there, uh, Cultivar de Orchidias Porcimias, because I actually got a book on 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 how to grow orchids from seed and store seed, uh, published in Spanish. Um, uh, because of course there's not a lot of information out there in Spanish and yet you know this is a, you know South America is a very important country in in terms of continent uh, in terms of um, of orchids if you go to Singapore of course you will see a very big educational project uh, you know you've got the gardens by the bay uh, which is absolutely amazing uh, if you go to Singapore, you must, you must uh, go there. But it, they, they have this, this, this cloud forest, uh, which I say you cannot believe the scale of it. You really cannot believe the, the scale of it. Just to, you know, to show you what, uh, what these, uh, what these habitats are, are like in, 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 in other countries. It's just a, a, you know, a fabulous resource and makes a, a very nice partner. Uh, for the uh, for the botanical gardens in in Singapore. So look, so for, you know, the question is, of course, you know, can we succeed when we come to to orchid reintroductions? And the answer, quite clearly, is 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 yes. Uh, in Britain, I have to say, we went down to one single plant of this orchid here, uh, Cypripedium calceolus. Uh, our native ladies slipper orchid, one plant at a secret location in Yorkshire, uh, because people would dig them up. Um, this is what uh, this is what happened, and it had a twenty-four. It still has a twenty-four hour guard on it, so nobody digs it up. Uh, but Q harvested seed and have started a very successful uh, reintroduction project. Of course, you know. You are doing similar things, aren't you? At uh, you know, at, 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 at Atlanta Botanical Gardens, you've got this 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 wonderful project with Curtipodium punctatum, the uh, this the cigar orchid, uh, which again, you know, was collected and collected in by their well, I don't know, you'll you'll be able to tell me, but their thousands, I would 
I would imagine in the in the past. Um, but you know, with a with a, a pollination program uh, taking place, and some of you no doubt uh, will remember and recognise uh, our friend uh, Matt uh, Matt Richard there uh, teaching teaching that young lady how to how to pollinate uh, orchids, and of course, then of course, you know, they got seed and this came back uh, to, to Atlanta Botanical Gardens and that young lady there is called Danny, um, and she attended our 2010 um, uh, workshop and, and the Naples Orchid uh, Society gave her a scholarship to come and work at Atlanta Botanical Gardens with, uh, with Curtipodium punctatum. You can make a difference to people's lives. It really, it really is true. Um, you know, by involving people in the OSU project, we have, you know, we have managed to help a lot of people. Let's uh, let's put it to you that way. And of course, you're not just interested in in, in epiphytic orchids. You do at Atlanta a lot of stuff with uh, with terrestrial orchids as well. Okay, so yeah, we're just going to have a look at just one or two projects before we, we wind up. Uh, again, I'm, you know, we're talking about Singapore uh, Botanical Gardens. Uh, they are, you know, doing, doing a lot of work in, in, in reintroducing uh, orchids into Singapore, which, which have, have, have disappeared. Uh, and they have a very, a very successful project uh, with, um, with a number of orchids, including uh, the world's largest orchid, the tiger orchid. Grammatophyllum uh, speciosum uh, that you can see there. The uh, the very attractive young lady there who's smiling at you is my wife. Um, so there you go. That's that's Joyce. Um, we uh, we went there on the way to see my lad in Aus Australia, as you can as you can imagine. So you know they pollinated their orchids and you know and then it, uh, but. but uh, and the, but then they got natural pollination and they've got natural reestablishment taking place. And, and that is obviously the aim, isn't it? Is to, is to get the orchids to become self-sustaining populations uh, once, uh, once again. Uh, another project, which is really quite, quite different, is a project I was involved with in Zambia, um, where they have a problem uh, with people digging up orchid tub tubers to make uh, to make a, a, a luxury food called chikanda. Uh, and uh, what they're trying to do is to, is to uh, cultivate this, uh, this orchid from, uh, or these orchids from the seed, uh, so that the local farmers could actually grow it rather than going out there and, and digging them up. It's uh, clearly a long-term project, uh, but it is, yeah, they're having, they're having some success on I'm pleased to say. Um, so there are projects, you know, taking place all all around the world, and you know they, you know, again just to make the point, uh, they involve not only sort of professional uh, orchid orchid people, but they 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 involve amateur orchid growers as well uh, and commercial growers. Uh, the person you can see on the top right there is uh, is my friend Vicente Perdomo in. Uh, in Colombia, down in Cali, uh, who is working with the local orchid association and with the uh, local botanical gardens uh, to reintroduce uh, Cattleya uh, quadricolor uh, back into the, the wild. It is still being illegally removed from its natural habitat, believe it or not. But yeah, Cattleyas are easy to grow from seed. There is no excuse as far as I can see. Yes, so here we go. Another project here in Chile, uh, where you've got youngsters uh, translocating plants from in, from a site where they're going to 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 building. You know, urban expansion is a problem for for orchid populations, and these these youngsters again are you know planting these these orchids in a in a safe a safe environment. So, you know, I say there are lots of there are lots of projects. Uh, going going on around the world. We'll just finish off with with one that's that, that, that really that really am amazed me, uh, because I was in Col Colombia 
in in Cali a few a few years ago now, and my 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 friends in Cali said, "What would you really like to see, Phil?" And I said, "Well, I'd like to see Cattleya trianae growing in in the wild if that's possible." And <laughs> it. So they they flew me from Cali up to Bogota and then down to Naiva because they said it's not safe to go over the Andes. So I was really quite em, embarrassed. But anyway, um, I was taken down into the into the south of uh, of Colombia to uh, to see to see these these uh, these orchids or to see if we could find them. And we ended up at the end of our trip in a place called uh, Guadalupe. And the thing about Guadalupe was that they, they took me there because there was a school teacher uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the school in, in Guadalupe as you, as you just drive in, in through the road. And what he's, what he's doing is he is, he's got the youngsters pla planting orchids in the trees. And so as you drive into, as you drive into Guadalupe, the trees are full of Cattleya uh, trianae. And, and I keep saying to people, I keep saying to young people, I want you to go back in 50 years time um, because it's going to be spectacular. But it just seemed to me to, uh, you know, to, to, to summarize really what we're trying to do. And that is, you know, to get children uh, excited by, uh, by the natural world. And the way to do that, of course, is always to, uh, to involve them in practical uh, projects. And so they will grow up uh, loving the, the natural environment. And, and uh, well, as I said at the beginning, I think it is our role in life as, as somebody who's older anyway, to do everything I can to make sure that environment is still there for them to be able to take, to take care of in 20 years time or, or, or longer. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. Uh, yeah, we've not done too badly. Uh, you know, as a, as a as a former teacher, you know, I, I'm very well aware that I can I can talk too much. Um, so we will um, we will finish there and see see if you have any questions. There you go. Well, thank you again so much, Phil. That was a, a very interesting, engaging talk. Um, so I know it's getting pretty late over on your side of the Atlantic. Um, so we can get rolling with the questions. If you're ready. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Uh, this is from uh, an anonymous attendee. They ask, when, do you, when you do hand pollinations of orchids in collections, are you using flowers from the same plant or different plants? I ask because some orchids suffer from inbreeding depression from being self. Well, ideally, then then I would use two different clones. Yeah, so I'd, I would use two different plants and I would do a, a reciprocal cross as well. Um, but if you've, if you've got something rare in your greenhouse and there's only one, uh, then then you are, you know, you, you, you're going to try and you're going to try and self it. And, and, and actually with with obsidians in particular, uh, you can have problems with inbreeding depression anyway. Uh, so that you know, you it just doesn't uh, you know they're self incompatible. Um, so uh, so it's it's always better if you can to have two uh, two different plants. And and of course your your problem then is that they might not be in flower at the same time. Uh, but you can store pollen for you know for quite a long time often. Um, for you know if you treat it in the same way as as you do your orchid seed if you if you dry it and and then put it in a sealed uh, tube. It will it will last for for a long time. Um, we've done this. We 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 had a project going with um, with one of our native orchids, Dactylorhiza fuchsii, and we were still getting uh, good pollen viability after six years. So it's yeah, it is it is worth thinking about um, pollen. And I think actually you you know. Uh, one of the things I would like to see happen, of course, is pollen exchange between botanical gardens. They may, they, you know, they may often have, you know, just the one odd specimen of, of a plant. It's like the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Lelia dorsonii that I, I showed you. It's just the one plant um, 
and I don't know of another one as yet that's um, that's in flower. I'm doing my best to see if there is something in the UK that we can do. Okay, uh, we also had uh, some questions from Liz Rios. Uh, one of those was, uh, how has climate change affected orchid conservation? Uh, there's a nice, I have a friend, uh, Mike Hutchins, who studied an orchid population in the UK of Ophrys Fagodes, it's one of our native bee orchids. And he did a 32-year project and monitoring the plants every year for 32 years. Here you see, Ian, here's something you can start. Monitor for 32 years or longer. It would seem it's probably the longest uh, project of its type for any plant. And he, he can tell you that it now flowers two weeks later than it did, sorry, I'm getting the wrong way around. It is, it, it flowers two weeks earlier on average than it did 32 years ago. So we know, wow. we know uh, that, um, you know, climate change is, 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 you know, having an effect on, on orchid populations. Um, but it, all sorts of things, isn't it? Really, we're starting to get birds in this country uh, that, you know, remaining over winter that never used to. We're getting insects appear uh, that didn't, which uh, were, weren't uh, present in this country. Uh, so we know that uh, the climate is changing. And, and, and one of the interesting things then is, is that being as, uh, you know, being as a lot of these orchids grow in, in, in sort of restricted habitats, yeah, they, the, 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 you know, they're in, uh, only in very small locations, whether we really ought to be doing assisted translocations of some of these plants. Uh, so that because, you know, they are unable to move naturally uh, from one place to another uh, because they're surrounded in a, by, in a sea of agriculture, uh, probably in this country anyway. So, it's a, yeah, climate change is, is interesting. And it's, and it's also affecting the, the cloud base in the cloud forest in places like Costa Rica, isn't it? The cloud base is gradually rising. Uh, so that, you know, the plants that grew lower down are now starting to move up the mountainside. And of course, those on the top of the mountain have got nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So lots of, yeah, there are lots of examples and lots of animal examples as well of this sort of thing happening. Um, I'm looking, there is a question from someone here in the chat. Not seeing it. Okay. Um, it's from Michelle Faust. Uh, she says, deepest thanks for an inspiring, fascinating class. Uh, and she asks, how can individual gardeners help in these conservation efforts? Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm sort of, I, I mean, I have, I have to say, I was, I, I, you know, people can grow orchids in their gardens. Um, and and that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 is a, that is a thing that people tend not to be, uh, to be so, so aware of. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I have a more sort of general answer to that. I, I mean, I think by, by the things that you can, you can grow in your, your garden, then you can, uh, you can, you know, you can encourage wildlife, you can encourage bees and other, other, uh, other insects in your garden. Um, I, I would really, I keep trying to encourage people in this in this country to to join their uh, local wildlife trust. Um, you know there are reserves that you can you can visit. Uh, they're, they're always looking for volunteers to uh, to I don't know clear scrub or or do things or to be involved in educational programs. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of things that you can you can do. Um, and they need your money, as I say to me. Well, yeah, but you see, my annual subscription to the Worcestershire Wildlife Trust helps, doesn't it? It's you know, it, it's, it's a small thing, but but cumulatively, that's you know, that's where they get their their money from. Okay, uh, we have a question from. Uh, oh yeah, do you have something to add, Emily? 
Lisa, uh, one, I see that you're a fourth grade teacher. We have a program that we are currently running um, as a pilot program where we're working with school teachers. We're actually um, based off of a lot of Phil's recommendations and um, some of his work that he's done. We're working with um, Atlanta schools to get micropropagation um, started and have the students um, helping us with monitoring um, the development of seed, orchid seeds and various different species um, in the classroom as part of a project. And we have a pilot going right now um, and depending on how well that goes, um, we'll be expanding that. So please feel free to reach out um, because that is something looking to engage more young people. That's brilliant. Sorry, Phil. I no, that's good. No, no, I, I, I yeah. really, really like that. It's, it's you know, the idea of getting more school children involved in, in schools is, is, uh, is what I would like to see. Okay, Phil, this is from uh, an anonymous attendee. They say, thanks, Phil, for your talk. Uh, how has OSU run since the end of Darwin funding? What have you been, what have been the main successes and challenges of keeping an ongoing network like this running for many years? Yeah, again, a very good question. Something really quite close to my heart at the moment. Yes, keeping a project going is difficult, uh, to, be, to, to be honest about it. It's um, the, uh, the Darwin Initiative uh, money is really sort of, um, what do we call it? Uh, capacity building. Um, so the idea was really is to get people uh, running on their, on their own. And keeping a project uh, going is, is, really quite, uh, is really quite challenging. And the, the, you know, if, if we want to be truthful about it, uh, when there's money, uh, for for projects for institutions, uh, then then it is quite straightforward. But in the end, it depends on the uh, on the um, on the enth enthusiasm of individuals. I have to say that's that's what uh, that's what, uh, what what happens. But but uh, but you know, I'm I'm really quite uh, really quite encouraged. I I have to say because uh, of, uh, last year. Uh, because of the lockdown, suddenly we find ourselves doing these these Zoom talks, which are which which is great. Because I was invited to um, to give a talk by a group in in Colombia, uh, in, in 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 very bad Spanish, I have to say, um, about orchid seed storage, and I had more than 500 people who were listening to my talk on the day, from countries all throughout South and Central America. Um, so there is a, you know, there is a lot of interest uh, out there, and um, and I and I'm, you know, and I get regular requests for the book that I pointed out to you, you know, the uh, growing orchids from seed in Spanish, uh, which really is is a, you know, it's it's there from from beginning to to end. But yeah, it's challenging. I, you know, I I spend uh, yeah, I spend a lot of my, a lot of time communicating with. Uh, with uh, with various uh, people, uh, yeah, and there are yeah there are lots of people now who are uh, running their own their own projects uh, after the uh, the Darwin uh, the Darwin money ran out, if you uh, if you will. Um, so Jason Chin has a, a pretty long one here. It's. On the one hand, the hobby has focused a lot on line breeding to produce superior floral characteristics, which can come at the expense of genetic diversity, and producing sterile triploids and artificial tetraploids. On the other hand, we are also heavily invested in the propagation and cultivation of rare and unusual species. Donate funds for research and as a community try to enforce ethical and legal practices in orchid collection. What do you think of the hobby's role in orchid conservation, including addressing looming issues like climate change and habitat loss? <laughs> <laughs> that was a big one. <laughs> well, again. Yeah, you, if, you, if you do just think about my school project for a moment, um, and then I'm, I'm sort of, 
I'm interested really in, in encouraging people in the, in the amateur world uh, to pollinate their plants. And so this, and, and actually I'm really quite successful with this as well. Uh, I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting an increasing number of people now who are actually starting to, uh, to, to pollinate their plants. And then they give me the seed and my students uh, grow uh, the, uh, the, uh, the plants from seed. Uh, and then uh, for the donors, I will give them uh, flasks of seedlings if they, they want them. Uh, and then, uh, then I distribute the, the flasks uh, to, uh, to orchid growers. I distribute the flasks to botanical gardens. I'll give them uh, to, uh, to botanical gardens. Um, and, and I will then sell uh, the, um, the, the remaining flasks uh, to, to amateur orchid growers who are very willing to buy them uh, because uh, then the donation gives me the money uh, to run my school orchid project uh, so that I'm not asking the school for, for any money uh, to, uh, to continue. So I think the, you know, I think the, the amateur grower in, in that sense has, a, has an important uh, role to, to play. Uh, but also in this country, I have to say, we have a system of, of, of national collections. And so there are, uh, there are amateur growers out there who would have a, this, uh, what shall we say? There is a national collection of uh, slipper, well, of puffy pedalums, uh, you know, Asian slipper orchids. There is a national collection of barkerias. Um, I'm just wondering actually if I'm gonna end up with a national collection of Lely Ranceps. I know it's a very one thing, uh, but, uh, but even so, uh, I've got a lot of genetic variation within my, my orchid population. Um, and then, of course, when I'm no longer able to look after it, then my orchids will be donated to some botanical gardens or uh, who, is, um, who would be able to, um, to continue looking, looking after it into, uh, into the future. Um, so so I, I think the amateur grower uh, has, a, has, a lot, uh, has a lot to offer to be to be quite honest, what they can do about global warming? Well, I don't know. They, what, what, what can we say? I mean, I. Well, come on. What what is the good news today? The good news today is that uh, is that your new president has has uh, signed the agreement to rejoin the Paris Agreement. I mean, what could be better than that? Um, and uh, you know, so you, you you know you have to vote for the right politician, don't you? That is, you know, this is what I, I say to students all the time, you know, you know, talk to the politician, vote for them. I'm not telling you which party to vote for, but what I am saying to you is that, you know, if this is what you're interested in, this is one of the factors you should be considering uh, when you're, you're voting, you know, the environment is the, is the big thing, isn't it? You know, global warming seems to be on the agenda and I'm, I'm, surprised and delighted to be quite honest now if we can get biodiversity on the the agenda in the same way then we yeah then I, then I will be happy uh this is a question from an anonymous attendee <laughs> what is the most uh, significant seed bank for orchids what country or region has had the most success with trying to stop poaching So there's really two questions there. The that, that's that's a that, that's a that's a good that's a good one again. Uh, the the biggest the best seed bank in the world. Well, it's the Millennium Seed Bank, isn't it? What can I say? Um, it's what is the best orchid seed bank? Uh, well, you know, I mean, it's that that's I, I don't. So I, I, I there are people who are going to argue. You've 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 certainly got some some very important seed banks in the USA. So, so, the, so the question for me really is, you know, what is the best seed bank for, 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 for orchids, if you, if you like. So when we set up the Darwin Initiative project, we had, an, we, there, there was an opportunity for countries to store seeds in duplicate collections at the Millennium Seed Bank. As far as I'm aware, the only country which has done that is Australia, uh, because Australia, uh, yes, had, 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 has, an, has an agreement with the Millennium Seed Bank. Uh, people are now very reluctant, for some reason, 
to, uh, to, to, to share their genetic diversity uh, because it's seen as being something which is valuable. Well, and it is valuable, but the, but, but the point is that the, the agreement with the Millennium Seed Bank says very clearly the seed still belongs to the donor country. Having said that, then I would still say the best place to store the orchid seed is in the country of origin. That, that is the case. And not only that, I would say that the best strategy would be to have duplicate seed banks, because then if something happens to one, then you've got an insurance policy in the other. But if you think about Colombia, Colombia has 4,270 species of orchid. That's going to take an awful lot of storing, isn't it? So I would suggest to you they need they need partners, um, but yeah. So I mean I would say you know where's the best place to do orchid conservation in the country of origin, you know you, that's that is that is you know the role of, I would say of somebody like myself who lives in a you know I I live in a very um, non orchid diverse uh, uh, country. Uh, the things that we can do is provide expertise, advice, uh, help, but really we need to be helping countries to do it themselves. Did that All right. Question? I don't know. Yeah, and I, I think they had a second part to that. I think it got deleted, but um, I'm trying to remember it was, remember what it was about, Emily? The second, yeah. You see, in this country, we have people collecting seeds from different orchid populations to conserve. Oh, I know which was the best country. Yeah, that that was it. About yeah. Okay, we've only got about we've got fifty odd species of orchid. Yeah. So we you know we can store all of those in the in the Millennium Seed Bank, which has been the best country for for. Um, Stopping illegal collection. I don't know. Well, we, we've been pretty successful in this country, but it still happens. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I know it does. I, I'm, I'm sure it happens in 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 the US as well. Um, it, you know, places where they've got big orchid populations like Colombia and Ecuador and Brazil. It's, um, I would say it's a lot more difficult to police, isn't it? And we have one last question from uh, Liz Rios, which is, have you noticed more genetic variability in response to climate change and environmental stress? No. No, no, only for the fact that I've, I don't know if, I mean, that's, that's more of a question for Emily. Um, I don't, I don't really. I, there have been some, there's been some research that has been looking into to this and showing that in ex situ conditions that there have been changes in genetic variability based upon the responses of, we baby our orchids in the wild, in, in ex situ, we can, we can provide them everything they need and there has been a few um, studies that came out um, in 2019 that showed um, some effects, which were very interesting um, within the F2 and F3 generations, because a lot of times you don't see that until, um, you know, normally much further um, away from parents. Because I would have said that we are, but you know, when you grow orchids in flask and then grow them in, a, in the greenhouse, you are, you are selecting those which grow best under artificial conditions. Uh, that's uh, that is that is bound to happen so that you know when you are yeah you 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 obviously your best strategy is, is what you did with the curtipodium punctatum which is collect seed from the wild and then grow it and then return it to the uh, back to its uh, to its habitat but i mean environments i mean it's a good question isn't it because because environments are changing uh, that's that's quite uh, that's quite quite obvious so are the orchids that are living in those you know, they're confined to that field I showed you of, of orchids changing or not, I have no idea. 
I suspect there would be in some way, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that about wraps it up for questions. That's um, a, that's 12. Oh, it's not too yeah. late. Yeah, not too bad. I <laughs> guess it's the new day for you, yeah. <laughs> not yet. No, not yet. Yeah. yeah. I don't have to get up in the morning, so I'm fine. <laughs> Well, I'm going to quickly share just the final, Phil, that was absolutely fantastic. We are so grateful for your, your talk. It was absolutely wonderful. I'm just sharing quickly. Um, so anybody who is interested, um, this is a link to uh, where you can find a uh, Science Cafe recording. So you'd be able to go back and watch um, this recording that Phil has um, so graciously um, given this great lecture for. So you can find it at that link there on our website. Um, and then our next um, Science Cafe webinar will be on February 18th from 6 to 7 p.m. again, Eastern Standard Time. And we are going to have Dr. Um, Marcella Serna, who is going to talk about Colombian magnolias. And she's going to be joining us from the far reaches of Colombia, um, Medellin, actually. Um, and we Thank you all so much. Please follow us on Instagram. Um, there's our handle at Atlanta BG Conservation. And we are just really uh, grateful for everybody joining us tonight. So thank you so much, Phil. Fantastic. Um, Pleasure. It's lovely. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for, for staying and, uh, and attending tonight. Excellent.